Sam Coniglio, who is the founder and president of Space Tourism uh, Fan Club. <laughs> yeah, what's this a fan club? Yeah, we're all big fans of Space Tourism. Sam knows awesome. everything there is to know about Space Tourism. So if you have any questions, just demand to ask. Sam, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for organizing this event. Thank you for inviting me to come over. Um, welcome, everyone. Glad you can make it. Um, this is a really neat thing. I've never actually been to a National Space Society uh, ISTC event before, so this is kind of uh, new to me. But I'm uh, very well known in the, in the circles with the Space Frontier Foundation. And I've been doing research on the space tourism since 1997, something like that. So uh, this is a, a uh, brief session on space tourism, get you up to speed. I'm assuming most of you have heard of the, of the, the concepts of space tourism. You've heard about Dennis Keto. Raise your hand. Or, yes? No? You know, maybe, kind of, sort of. Okay. So what we're doing here is basically just kind of an update of the state of the industry, what, what's happened over the past uh, year or so. So uh, because of time constraints, I'm not going to be able to do my full presentation. In fact, I'm just going to go to like one slide just to give you a quick status of what I've seen. I'll stay the industry, and then we'll go straight over to Chris Freda from Space Adventures to do his presentation, and then to Peter Diamandis from uh, the X-Prize, and then Ms. Paola Pavata, who is an aerospace architect, will talk about uh, space habitats. So with that, I'm going to just talk real quickly. I'm going to just go over along to the session I'm going to talk about. The state of the industry today, the Columbia tragedy of February 1st, 2003, shocked everyone, especially us here in the industry, people have been following this for years. Um, we were, okay, is this the end of the space shuttle program as we know it? You know, is this the end of space travel as we know it? There was a lot of debate that came out in the public about, you know, are, are, is manned space travel, travel just over? Is it not going to happen? But based on some of the surveys that happened after the event, the general public still believes that public space travel is, is, is Important and exciting. I still think it should go on. Um, also, as we will talk about in a few minutes, there are four, at least four X Prize contenders building and or flying prototype vehicles. Also, as we know, two paying travelers who already visited the International Space Station and is to the Marshall. The mere fact that they flew and got global coverage proves that you know this is really becoming a legitimate industry. Also, we've actually got some real market studies. So in case form of the uh, Zogby Fluid Futron study, talking about talking about the, the market potential for the next uh, 20, 30 years. And with that, I'm going to move on to Chris Ranetta, let him talk about space ventures and also implications of some of the uh, projects to date. So, wonderful thing happened on April 18th. A band of small engineers, about 15 people unveil flight hardware for a manned spacecraft. So I'm going to first start out and talk about that, but let's, I'm also going to talk about some other technologies here, spacesuits, robotics, and mobile space systems. And, and basically how some of these, the, the costs for, these, for this technology, these technologies can be reduced through participation of smaller, small teams, small contractors. And there, I also want to just uh, give a little, little footnote. And when I say a small team, generally these small teams are supported. The, 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 small, te the small team, the core team, is, are the system integrators. And they're supported by a wide, wide range of contractors, which uh, could possibly be very large uh, traditional aerospace companies. So let's uh, let me proceed to try and go through this. So mobile systems. Well, so what have we learned at Space Adventures? Uh, we we basically proven that the suborbital market exists. We have over 100 reservations to fly on suborbital vehicles. Uh, we found, uh, I'm sure, a lot of people who were involved in developing private suborbital vehicles that really angel investors that were primary sources for funding. Um, as we've heard earlier, um, the, the regulatory process to the FAA is not non-trivial. Uh, it has yet to be properly formulated to, uh, to move forward. But that's not to say that they're, they're not trying at the FAA. And uh, we should all be very supportive of their efforts. And you know, finally, uh, a reliable, low-cost effort is, is half the battle, in, or maybe a third of the battle, in, in developing a low-cost um, and and or reusable uh, orbital space plane, sub-orbital space plane. 
And so the, the industry uh, bought it along. I say the industry, I mean the, the fledgling um, suborbital, private suborbital vehicle development industry. It's kind of plotted along until, until April of this year. And uh, it was interesting to, to note that there were some early photographs of, of White Knight on the runway. And, and we saw these pictures of Aviation Week. And right away, we noticed how much ground clearance the, the main body on the vehicle. And we were like, oh my god, it's a, it's a, it's a first stage to a two stage reusable vehicle. And I mean, it's interesting, it's interesting to look at the, uh, the work history of uh, the product history of, of Proteus and it's developed Voyagers flew around the world on, on without refueling. Um, again, very low cost, um, small focus team. Uh, Proteus, which is known as the poor man's spy plane. And so it, a, lot of, a lot of capability, a lot of skills there within this small focus company. Again, here's a better, better shot of White Knight. And this is a system, I mean, half of it or arguably maybe even a third of it is, is flying right now. It's an operation. And it's, it's an amazing achievement. Again, you know, for, for probably less than $20 million, flight hardware for a manned system, not orbital, suborbital, but for a very little amount of money, um, flight hardware has been produced. And what's interesting is that this is, a, this is a byproduct, this is the end result of the X Prize. And so really, arguably, even if this vehicle never flies, the X Prize has been successful in, in achieving its results because it has, it has in a sense, uh, defined a, an industry, suborbital vehicles. It's created this industry, and, and this is essentially the, uh, the by prize. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that the stage has been set, um, and largely through the, uh, the X Prize. So good work for you. <laughs> And I, again, uh, another another small group here, uh, X Corps. What I find fascinating about the X Corps guys, I mean, they're they're cutting their teeth. They're they're uh, a small band of engineers developing um, rocket engines and, and and working on using that technology, hopefully applying it towards a uh, some uh, reusable rocket plane. And what's fascinating here is that is their test bed. That they developed. Um, it is a, it's a, uh, essentially a, a rocket plane fitted to uh, uh, one of the Burma tanks, very easy. And um, what, what I find fascinating about this same process that Sergei Korolev went through, he, he also built a rocket plane, and that's how he was able to cut his teeth in, in uh, launch vehicle development. So it's, um, it's, it's nice to see sort of the sim similar processing. A similar process happening again. Um, again, C-21, this is um, a Russian <coughs> effort um, that is very similar to uh, Spaceship One in that it's a two-stage two wing approach. And I, I think that, uh, you may have noticed the bullet earlier in my slide, but I, I think that, um, that winged suborbital vehicles are probably the, the best and, and safest approach because you do have, you have a wide range of, you have many opportunities to fail gracefully, which is really nice. <laughs> you, know, you can take off here, and if you have an engine failure, you can dump fuel and hopefully get back to the runway. Uh, you do obviously do a checkout before you release your second stage, and if that doesn't work, then, then you come back and report. Um, and this particular vehicle has both, uh, it's capable of a, of a glider, return and the parachute return and it also has ejection seats so basically you're wearing their pants with both belts and suspenders and uh, it's a real it's a nice it's nice to have several options in, in the event of failure. So let me jump now. I'm sorry this is a little bit scatterbrained this is really kind of how I think but uh, uh, let me talk about spacesuits. Spacesuits uh, for example uh, the suits that uh, Berber tanks people will likely use are the uh, same suits that are used on the, the Proteus and, and the SR-71. And these run about $100,000 a piece. Interestingly, the, uh, the Russian so-called suit is, is about the same price. And so this is an area where there, it's the, 
possibility of using another technical base um, the, the cost for for developing the suits could be greatly reduced. <coughs> for example, you look at dry suit technology and scuba diving. Essentially, it's a it's a suit that must remain airtight uh, at depths greater than 300 feet, and so there's a considerable amount of pressure on that suit. And, and so there's a technical base there, and again, these are s smaller companies. Most of them are owned by uh, by large conglomerates, but um, where we could we could use this industrial base to lower the cost of spacesuits, and this is important because most likely when we do suborbital space tourism, we're going to need a wide range of different sizes of spacesuits. We're going to need a large inventory of them, and so we, we need to be able to, to, to be able to reduce the production cost there. Now I'm jumping over to the buys. Right now, uh, the ISS, uh, the, the, the mainstay for logistics, is is provided by. Uh, a robotic vehicle, and uh, so robotics are playing a key role right now in, in keeping the ISS going. And you know, of course, as you, as you all know, uh, teleoperated um, robotics plays a, a significant role at this point in the assembly of ISS with the Canadian Canada R2, for example. But I, I believe that it, robotics could play an even even greater role, maybe some by um, Utilizing free-ranging robotics that are, that are attached to the station and, and can maneuver around the station on their own. I mean, imagine uh, having these robots teleoperate from Earth. You could run literally run them 24 hours a day. You run shifts from the control station, and uh, you could do all your maintenance. And basically, what happens is you free up the crew so that they're able to do science rather than rushing around trying to do some assembly work, trying to do maintenance on the station. The station is very complex. And when it gets older, it's going to require a lot of maintenance. And so we'd much rather have the crew on board focusing on science and then have uh, teleoperated or maybe uh, AI or independently uh, intelligent uh, robots servicing the station. And to give you an idea, you know, Nemo is, um, is essentially a, a, it's a 14, robot that was developed in the 1980s for about $14 million. It operated at a depth of 8,000 feet. And at 8,000 feet of seawater, it's uh, it's, a, it's an extremely hostile environment. You're actually <coughs> capable of driving a pencil eraser through the hole of uh, the same diameter as a human hair. So it's a much more corrosive and hostile environment than the vacuum in space. And they were able to develop this robot, with it, which had very intricate um, manipulation capabilities, very precise movement, for about $14 million. And it seems that we could essentially apply this technology to building robots to, uh, to service the space station. No, by the way, again, it's another small team, a small team of about 14 people system integrated this robot. Um, I guess they were su supported by a wide range of larger contractors, but at the core there was a small team that, that made this thing work and they covered essentially a billion dollars in, uh, in California gold. So let's get on to uh, orbital. One of the, I've been looking a lot at, um, at the telecommunications industry and, and looking at what's going to happen with it. And I really believe that a lot of the payloads, communications payloads, satellites, we're actually going to lose more of them. And um, the main reason being, or here's, here's some other technologies. And, and really, you know, the cell tower is, is one, of the, one of the greatest satellite killers. Um, out there, um, but we're also seeing um, we've got plenty of fiber optics now in the ground, especially in the United States. They aren't even being um, being lit, and uh, so there's there's plenty of capacity uh, in in the ground in place that can be used once the economy gets better, and um, certainly the capability of Wi-Fi um, is another another technology that will reduce the need for telecommunications satellites. I think really the up and coming technology that, that will play a major role in killing satellites are unmanned um, UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, which can be stationed over population centers. I mean, really, there's, there's no money in, in giving a, a farmer a dial tone. I mean, certainly from the standpoint of uh, ethics, it's, it's a good thing to do, given the opportunity to, to develop. But really, the money is in population centers. And, 
And uh, essentially, you know, you just station a UA, a solar powered UAV, for example, over a population center, and you've got you know, a very low geostationary platform to provide your communications. And certainly, uh, these could relay from one, one platform from, to another or satellite, but it, I, I really think it reduces the need. So, you know, why, why am I getting at this? Why am I talking about telecommunications here? And, and the reason being that we need, we have a wonderful resource that has just been created. I mean, we are launch vehicle rich in this country. We have, essentially, I don't show the third view up here because it's not completely American. The Atlas V, the Delta IV, and, and the C-Launch uh, Zenith three are modern launch vehicles that we have at our disposal, that which can be man-rated. And uh, this is a capability, I think, simply because of the fact that these launch vehicles exist and that they eventually can be cost-effective through, through large volumes of launches and just through tough negotiations. Uh, I think that we should we should capitalize on this asset to, to build the next generation of uh, launch vehicle, or I'm sorry, of, of human crewed space transportation. And uh, essentially, here is some some guidelines. I'll, I'll just in the interest of time, I'll move through these. But you know, I see an involved mission growth, I mean, really to to uh, to improve reliability, to ensure the reliability. You start out with small missions and you scale up with the complexity. And uh, so I, I think that you know a stepped approach, a rational approach to uh, developing uh, crude systems, I think will, will, will greatly ensure its reliability um, for, for the crews. And, and again, here is just, uh, if you launch an OSP, you rather than try and First, you, 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 in free flight, you do maneuvering operations, but then why not practice on it? You're going to hold progress end that's on, on its way to the Pacific Ocean, um, and rendezvous with dock with it. And certainly, if it's unmanned, both vehicles are unmanned, and there's a problem, you know, you can just dispose of it to them. But it'd be a great way to, to, get that, to get that experience without, without risking the crew. <coughs> And, and again, I, I think really our best bet, just given all our experience with uh, with space planes, I think that a small small um, orbital space plane is the right approach if it's done right and if it's done cost effectively. I mean, you can. I'm sure that, that you can make an inexpensive mini shuttle, but I'm also sure that you can make a very very expensive mini shuttle if you, if you try hard enough. Um, you know, just given the fact that the United States really doesn't have the room to, to land a capsule, we want to land people within our own borders. I think that the mini show is the right approach. And, you know, I, I hope, uh, and, and in conclusion, really, I hope that we can all get beyond conventional chemi chemical rocketry and, and stop dragging all our fuel with us into orbit, leave the fuel on the ground, leave the main engine on the ground. I think uh, laser propulsion is, is certainly one technology that has a lot of potential. And uh, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Next up is going to be Peter Diamandis. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, Chris has been uh, one of the uh, movers and shakers and uh, entrepreneurs in the space business for how long, Chris? About 13 years. About 13 years. That's so, proud to have him as part of the Space Adventures team. Uh, my passion, my personal passion, started at the age of nine. I wanted to go into space. Uh, I went and spent uh, ten years in grad school getting a medical degree and a bunch of you know, six-pack engineering degrees, and found out halfway through that process that I would, to go into space in traditional modes, required that I'd have to really hold my tongue and be a well, if, if I was lucky enough to get accepted to be an astronaut, you know, which your chances are like one in a thousand or so, then you'd have to really hold your tongue to get a chance to go to fly to orbit. And if you were successful in being an astronaut, because half the astronauts who have been accepted have never flown to orbit. I love that adage, they're called penguins because they have wings but they don't fly. <laughs> and then if you're lucky, you have a chance of flying twice during your 10-year career. And, you know, I said, 
That's not my vision of flying in space, for God's sakes. Now, if I'm a mountain climber, I can go and climb a mountain. If I'm a scuba diver, I can go and get a scuba suit and go and you know, scuba dive down to the deepest trenches I want. If, we, if we're, we're space explorers, we need to have a way of getting into space on a regular basis. And so, you know, I know many of you are, have the same passion, and I believe that the issue for accessing space has been that the ships just haven't existed. Um, and the XPRIZE is one mechanism uh, among many. There have been a lot of valiant efforts to try and fund vehicles. Um, and I hope that sometime in the next two or three years we're going to see the breakthroughs that give us the first capable vehicles. So, uh, I'm going to give you an update on the XPRIZE and also an update. Uh, I was asked to give an update on Zero G, so I'll do that as well. So, for those of you who don't know, the X Prize is a $10 million cash prize. Uh, the teams have to be privately financed. No government dollars need be allowed. I know that it's a difficult thing for a company to take government dollars, but I've learned from personal experience, and many others have, that once you start doing that, it sways the way you think. And I don't want to be swayed again. So, privately funded, you have to fly a vehicle that can carry three people up to 100 kilometers altitude come back down and then two weeks make the trip again. Uh, the objectives of the competition are, one, very importantly, to create a new generation of heroes. Because you know, today, you know, most people are excited about basketball stars and football stars. But, you know, how many people in the audience here can name the two ISS, the folks in ISS right now? Please raise your hand high if you can name those two. Okay, so here we are in a space conference and four people in the audience can do that. That's, you know, that's pretty sad. We, we've turned people who fly into space from heroes where we used to not only know what their names were, what they ate for breakfast, the names of their dogs, their wives, whatever, and, and we don't know them now. So we need to create some new heroes because you go to a, 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 a conference on race cars and you can name every race car driver there and there's a difference. And the fact of the matter is, you know, for NASCAR, the, uh, the marketplace for NASCAR paraphernalia is $1.5 billion a year. Pretty amazing stuff. We want to engage a global audience across all ages and all media. We want to inspire and educate. And as a result of these ships, um, we hope to create some markets, public space flight. And I want to be, you know, I know this is called space tourism, but I, I want to put a seed in the audience here that we should be referring to this as public space life, not public and not space tourism. Because I want to make sure that we're not viewing the people here as just passive tourists. That these are people who are going to train and are going to be, you know, space travelers. Global same day package delivery, rapid intercontinental uh, passenger travel, and the smallest, the smallest marketplace, the most insignificant marketplace in the future is going to be putting satellites on. Not that there's anything wrong about those, but I just think those are the numbers. We've gotten some great endorsements by folks. Tom Clancy is one of our large personal financial donors. He's also a large, uh, in one large investor in Rotary. Um, you know, it's public, you know, the public loves space. And uh, we know that over and over again. And my question is, why aren't there, why aren't there 5,000 people here at this conference? What are we doing wrong? if it's one of the most popular areas where we don't have that connection right now. So I just ask you to think about that. Uh, we have had a huge amount of media increase. We're now, I think, over 1.5 billion media impressions. We've had exponential growth. Uh, there's some four or 5,000 articles right now, 20 odd documentaries going on. And the reason, I think, is people love races. You know, the fact of the matter is, that one horse going around the track is a boring, you know, watching a horse, but put a bunch together, you're a horse race, and people love competition. So the X Prize has, you know, has done something successful in terms of just getting people thinking in terms of a race and putting in context so the public can, can be excited about it. Uh, one of the things that we did at the X Prize because uh, uh, as a warm up is we did something called the Lindbergh flight. Eric Lindbergh, who's uh, my vice president there, Charles Moore's grandson flew nonstop, recreating his grandfather's flight from Europe to Paris, and we built a mission control.
Control Facility in St. Louis, which uh, uh, will be the mission control for the X Prize flights as well. And again, one of the objectives here is to inspire young kids to get excited about space again. Because I know when I was growing up, my expectation was I had a chance to fly, we all had a chance to fly. Everybody was excited about it. Now, kids just don't get it because we've successfully created the, the belief in them that it's not something they can do. And if, and if, they, if it's not something they can do, why should they be excited about it? We need to change that and get them to believe that it's something they can, they can personally participate in. We have uh, 24 teams now from seven nations that have registered for the competition. They'll spend between two to twenty million dollars to uh, to win win the X Prize. To show you a little bit, uh, uh, Chris shows a few images. Let me extend extend those. Uh, Bert was the first person to register for the competition back in uh, May of 1996, and uh, he has spent somewhere on the order of he has given an exact number of somewhere between ten to twenty million dollars to build his ship, which is privately funded. Uh, two days ago, we did capture carry tests. Of, uh, of the White Knight, uh, which, was, uh, which was great. And next week, I know that he's planning uh, uh, some more engine firings. And he'll go from here to glide tests, where he'll do releases and make sure that the uh, vehicle can glide down properly. And then when he ignites the uh, nitrous oxide engines on board that vehicle, it'll be the first privately funded supersonic rocket driven airplane. And when he points it upwards, hopefully, uh, one of the first to go to, go to space. Let me show a little bit of a video here. This is from his robot. Rockefeller Center, which are called Rockefeller Center now. 
uh, back, and getting that vehicle across the GW Bridge after 9-11 was quite a challenge. <laughs> Uh, but they actually took an age-old design, they took a V-2 rocket, which, um, funny enough, they used to go from Germany towards London. Uh, this is now being built in London, Ontario, so that's a little bit of irony there. Uh, and they actually have modernized the, uh, the V-2 and put passenger uh, compartments on board. You can see in the center uh, end photo below, that's a 57,000 pound uh, alcohol uh, LOX engine, which they are getting ready to test fire within the next week or two. And that's very exciting. This is definitely one of the teams that's out there. They're, they're building four aero bodies for that vehicle. Uh, Advent Launch Systems in Houston. Uh, Jim Ackerman uh, was one of the folks in Bass Propulsion in, uh, at JSC. And Jim is building, has built a, a LOX methane. A little side note, I had the pleasure of uh, going and visiting Jim in his home back about, about <coughs> nine, ten months ago, and I, I said, Jim, you know, have you guys given up on your vehicle? Which I haven't heard from you in a while. What's going on? He says, absolutely not. He opened up his, his book of photos. He goes, we had ourselves a rocket ship built 100 miles out of here, outside of Houston in a rice field. And, and there it is. Uh, they're doing cryogenic tests in the bottom left. Um, the most difficult thing has been getting that thing. Uh, getting propulsion systems now, getting uh, the fuel. They actually are getting gaseous methane delivered and have built their own condenser. And this is what these teams are doing. It's, you know, these are garage bands doing everything they can to try and make it themselves. Now, I asked Jim how he's funding it, and he said, well, uh, most of them are retirement pay, uh, but I was also one of the invent inventors on the Debakey heart pump, and I get a royalty check each month, and I put that towards my spaceship. Pretty amazing stuff. Uh, this is Pablo de Leon. Uh, one of the things I'm uh, extremely proud of is being a co-founder of ISU. And Pablo is a, uh, a graduate of ISU. And uh, uh, he actually decided to build a vehicle that looks like Little Joe. The upper left-hand uh, image here. Thank you, Chris. Here's this. Right over, thank you. Here's a Little Joe vehicle that was used by NASA to test the escape system of the Apollo capsule reentry. And here's Mercury that put uh, Glenn up in suborbital, um, uh, Alan Shepard's suborbital flight. Well, he's actually designing and building his own vehicle. They're using, using hybrid engines. They've taken their capsule up to 96,000 feet in the darkness, and they just built their own spacesuit, which they took to 30,000 foot and a half to glider and test it. They're building all the components of their own space program, which is very exciting. Uh, we heard from Chris about C-21, another X-Prize entry. Uh, here is uh, Steve Bennett, who is one of the first people to actually fly a vehicle with an X-Prize logo on it. This was uh, his uh, Nova vehicle, which he flew uh, in November of 2001. And he has actually been doing drop tests. He's dropped himself out of a C-130 with an ATV vehicle. That's, that's him right there. Um, to look at Rien, you know, practicing landing on a gliding parachute. And he's getting ready right now to take the capsule of the Nova and actually drop it out and practice re-entry gliding. Again, homegrown band. I'm so proud of what the guys are doing. And they are, they've just finished liquid engine tests and he is planning to launch himself on this vehicle up to uh, 100 kilometers altitude as a, as a X-Prize precursor. Uh, Bob Truax, one of the most experienced people out in the industry. Bob built Thor uh, for the Air Force and also built uh, Evil Knievel's Sky Cycle over here. And I went and visited Bob recently and he took me to a storage facility. And in this storage facility over here, there were someone's uh, old lawn furniture. And this one was their old university books. And in this one, Bob kept his rocket. <laughs> now, Bob's 85 years old. Bob's still building spaceships, and God bless him. On the other end of the spectrum is John Carmack. Uh, John's made a, a large amount of money in the software industry and, and has done an amazing job in reinventing the way um, he and his team think about launch vehicles. Uh, I'll show you a video, actually, and let that speak to it. This is, uh, this is John's most recent video.
2002 marked the announcement of Armadillo Aerospace's official entry into the X Prize, which will award $10 million to the first private group to send three people into space. The Armadillo team has begun design and fabrication of the full-size X Prize vehicle, which they intend to fly by the end of the year. Concurrently, the team has been testing a two-foot diameter rocket using the same systems that will be used on the larger vehicle. The large-scale vehicle tests have recently involved testing the crushable section of the nose cone, which will attenuate the vehicle's parachute light upon returning from space.
Uh, it actually replaced rear-mounted center engines. It's a better, smoother parabola. Uh, there's a large fleet of, fleet of the 7.2s, and um, uh, I won't go through the technical side, but we went and did uh, multiple series of tests and modified some of the systems on board. We're actually able to patent those modifications. So the uh, concept here is that we use a, a cargo airplane. Typically, out of this cargo door comes these 11 pallets, and they're filled with cargoes, everything from, from uh, flowers from South America to auto parts, whatever. And that air, those, these airplanes fly cargo overnight, typically from 10 o'clock at night to 8 o'clock in the morning. And the cargo industry has these airplanes sitting on the ground all day long and on the weekends. So what a wasted asset. So we were actually able to design our system to make use of these airplanes when they're sitting. So we don't have to own or buy airplanes. We rent, we charter these airplanes on an hourly basis from the cargo operator. We're actually able to patent that business method of dual use of cargo and, and zero G. Here you see our interior of the airplane, pallet mounted, the foam pad. So if we have uh, three pallets of seats, 30 seats, 25 customers and five trainers, and uh, about 75 linear feet for you to play Superman or Superwoman. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have selected two Florida-based operators. We've since down selected to one of those. Uh, they provide us access to two or more airplanes. Um, maintenance is at the highest level. We went and our operator part 121, which is the level that United American and DHL and the FedEx have to operate at. Uh, we train their crews. We have uh, hull and third party and a million dollar per client additional insurance. Our baseline is going to be operations out of Orlando and Las Vegas. And we can fly the airplane to other cities as well as required. Um, again, the patents and the trademarks and the uh, STC are in place. And NASA by law cannot compete with us. Uh, the, the Airbus in France is uh, also not allowed to carry the public because it's an experimental airplane. It was the first Airbus 300 off of the uh, line, so it was not a certified airplane. And their price is about $100,000 to $200,000 a flight. The Illusion 76, I've flown it. Uh, we marked that for Space Adventures. It's a great airplane, but it's a different type of airplane. It's sitting on the ground there. Um, you wear a parachute on takeoff, and you can only um, uh, fly about a dozen parabolas before that airplane doesn't fly. We can fly 40 or 60 or 100 parabolas on this airplane and fly it. Uh, there are five markets. Um, the entertainment and film industry, we've already flown six flights for one of the major motion pictures. Uh, we flew that uh, uh, last year. And uh, we've been approached by every major space movie out there. Um, Promotions and special events, another large marketplace for us. Uh, adventure tourism is a, is a huge market. We are one of our, our partners, sister companies, resellers of Space Adventures. There are others out there we're, we're talking to, but this is the main market for us. It's flying the public. We're going to be offering a day-long experience where you basically train during the day. Uh, you're with every flight has got a, uh, a veteran astronaut on board. And you go up and we'll do about 20 parabolas. And I have lunch, I see. <laughs> Sorry about that. that <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll, uh, we'll fly 20 parabolas. And we chose 20 because most people you know, do well for 20 parabolas. Uh, motion sickness kicks in more seriously afterwards. And one thing that we're doing that's unique is we're going to be flying uh, the first five parabolas will be Martian gravity. And so you'll fly you know, five Martian parabolas, then we'll fly five lunar parabolas, and we'll fly ten zero-g parabolas. My mission with zero-g is to get the public excited. I want to educate them about future missions to Mars, about mining the moon, about orbital operations, and make this as was said in the previous panel, make this the first step. So once they do this, it's something that everybody can afford. They are just can't wait to go on suborbital flights. We can't wait then to go beyond that. Um, so that's uh, the public uh, corporate incentive. Uh, we have about 100 letters of intent signed 
uh, with potential players. Uh, education and corporate research is a large marketplace for us as well. And then uh, uh, NASA is also a potentially large uh, market, as well as being able to bring the airplane up to, uh, to Toronto, Montreal and fly for the Canadians, or take it down to South America and fly for uh, the Brazilians. I'm going to end with a short, fun video. How many of you folks in here know your uh, uh, Penn Gillette from Penn and & Teller? Um, and also uh, Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. We're about to see both of them flying in the future. This is during, during uh, our flights. We did the motion picture. It's, uh, we're just, we were training the uh, pilots during that, and we brought them along for fun. Penn is a big guy. The a downward back guitar, Billy. <laughs> so, all right, folks, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, well, we're running a little bit late on time, but how many of you can stick around for like the Q and A session just around lunchtime, or a little bit, maybe 10, 15 minutes afterwards? Pretty cool with that. Yeah. Yes. Raise hands. Pretty good. Pretty good. Okay. All right. Uh, Paulo Favata will be making a presentation on space habitats, and after that, we'll have some question and answer time. So uh, this will be a very, very brief presentation about space habitats. And we know today when we talk about uh, habitats in, in orbit, in space, uh, we, we have to refer to space labs because they are the only one where astronauts and, and cosmonauts uh, have been and are uh, doing experiments. And so we will have a, a very fast overview about uh, uh, the space labs, how they are today and how they could be improved because we know that uh, a more comfortable and uh, <coughs> functional interior design help uh, for sure from one side the astronaut and cosmonaut to work more efficiently. From the other side, uh, side allow them to, to be more comfortable inside um, the habitats, the, the, the space modules, and so also enjoy the mission. From uh, the, the, la the last part of the presentation, instead we'll focus uh, we, uh, on the space resorts, space hotels, or however we want to call these uh, new um, habitats the next frontier uh, linked to the commer commercialization of space. So, uh, because we want to be realistic, we know that uh, currently the only um, modules uh, uh, that are safe are tested, uh, pressurized module that can uh, be adapted, uh, can host people, are the aluminum rigid ones. So we have uh, on the left the uh, MPLM, uh, on the right we have the traditional 24X uh, aluminum module, and in the center we have the load, the pressurized load, that is for sure very small, but it, can, it could give uh, the possibility to, to enlarge a, a possible space habitat. So, we, as we see, uh, we have a very, very little free space per person inside the, 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 the destiny module, uh, about 15 uh, cubic meters, but uh, always remaining within the uh, test the space module, we can consider the Svetsta uh, service module, which is uh, bigger than uh, the traditional uh, aluminum uh, module, the destiny, and which could uh, um, give to each person uh, basically double of the free space. And this is not to evaluate if we uh, think uh, to improve the quality uh, of the lifestyle inside, especially if we uh, talk about space tourism. And um, so, uh, because we, we know that in, uh, inside the confined, uh, this confined uh, habitats, environment, uh, even a very, very small space can be very important, a free space, I mean. But uh, when we start to think about uh, uh, space hotel, we obviously design more space. Uh, I'm an architect, so uh, for me it would be fantastic to have a, an amount of free space to rearrange inside and where to create new functions linked to the amusing uh, microgravity. But um, up to now, 
these are two examples of a uh, way of thinking, two different philosophies. From one side, there is the inflatable technology, so the Transab, which have been uh, developed, studied, then stopped, unfortunately, uh, in the thousand, 2001. And from the other side, uh, the uh, shuttle external tank that for sure would, be, would offer a huge amount of uh, free space, but as to, both should be developed. And as you see uh, in, at the bottom, you would have a lot of free space per person. So the possibility, for example, inside the optic of the space tourism, to organize a lot of uh, private rooms, may, maybe different one from each other, a lot of uh, social activities, <coughs> and so on. So now we have an idea of what, are the, what is the lifestyle inside the module today. Uh, we know that we are talking about space mission, but we also know that all this confusion uh, can distract uh, the concentration even during uh, an experiment. And uh, so uh, if we think about the human habitat, in habitat interaction, we have uh, um, a lot of points that, uh, uh, like uh, the poor quality of uh, the design, the, monotonous co in, the monotony in color, colors, uh, the poor flexibilities, uh, and many requirements that uh, for sure could be, could be improved uh, to increase the uh, quality of the lifestyle for the, the same astronaut and cosmonaut. And then also having benefits in the human-human interaction. So uh, let's uh, have an idea of what uh, we should do in order to improve the quality of this design, interior design. For sure, uh, the first requirement is the safety because we want to avoid, or if not possible, at least reduce the dangers. So we have fire, noise, radiation, vibration, and so on. But the second point is the feasibility, so the technology. And so we can use the current uh, technology, uh, yeah, gassing uh, uh, compatible materials, and uh, the current appropriate uh, uh, production technologies to realize uh, and to reconfigure the interiors in a, in a different way. Uh, for sure, from, especially from the architectural point of view, the, the functionality is a, most, a, a very important point because everything is inside these habitats, uh, even they are for mission, space mission uh, experiments or for space tourism, tourism, they have to be functional. So everything has to be configured like a chair or a table, has to be configured in a very quick time and very easy way. So best if in, in one operation. Um, if it is a, a mobile furniture, for example, or even in two, but very, in a very easy way. Then there is ergonomics, which is important because it is uh, uh, the body, the natural body posture uh, that we acquire when we are in the space uh, leads us to conceive in a different way the furniture. So we have to uh, conceive and to know a different kind of comfort with a different kind of positions and uh, also shapes. And also the aesthetic is not the last uh, important because uh, especially if we think about space tourism we need to have an artistic value inside because uh, otherwise uh, it wouldn't be attractive the, the habitat. Uh, I have talked with, uh, um, curiously, with Mary Stito last year and I've asked uh, just this, would you have liked more to go there uh, up uh, in orbit if uh, the environment, the, the habitat would have been different? And I shouldn't say this because I'm an actor, but he said no, because uh, I just wanted to experiment the microgravity. But uh, I obviously have to disagree with this position because uh, I am sure that if uh, he would have had a completely different environment, very comfortable, where to enjoy what you have, where to play with, the, uh, do many, carry out many activities, recognize the visual cues, and move more, uh, more comfortable, uh, it, it, would be, it would have been more enjoyable. So I'm sure about uh, this point. And I'm sure, I'm sure that the space tourism will, will go in this direction. So this is, uh, going back, uh, the, multi, uh, the multiple post logistic module, which is actually very small, but uh, and, uh, used, uh, used in space, but, uh, in the International Space Station, that would be uh, rearranged inside uh, with the simplicity, but also um, in a way which uh, would uh, 
uh, offer multifunctional areas where to uh, alternate uh, activities. Also here, for example, we have uh, the, the two quarters, which are retractable, uh, once again, to gain free space. And when uh, people need them, they could be configured and extended. And uh, also, we can think to connect the MPLM with the node, for example, why not to enlarge the inside, the, the internal space, to, to fit new activities. Uh, here again we are linked uh, to the concept of the space missions but why we shouldn't improve the quality of the interiors and the lifestyle inside the, the module for the space mission and uh, so we have a few images where we can see that uh, the, the concept to use the inter interior uh, in many di directions using the floor, the ceiling and so on could be useful within the concept of the local orientation, but uh, we have to recognize what we have around uh, and recognize the function. So now we jump to the uh, space tourism, the, the next frontier uh, that we all hope, and uh, obviously from one side we, the space station, future platform has to be reliable, has to have low cost and profitable returns, we, we know this. And uh, what we can do to, to realize this uh, platform, this, this new space resource? From one side, we could uh, develop a new module, pro, um, pressurized module to contain people, uh, and using the exist uh, uh, existing technologies to configure the interiors of this module. And uh, here maybe we think about uh, uh, inflatable module, very big, uh, able to host uh, very big hotels for many guests. Uh, but uh, we have the, uh, the problem that uh, we have to face uh, new technologies, uh, time, uh, time to, to test them, and also high cost. So in a short term, in the first step that we can do immediately, we could use the existing module that have been tested in orbit, adapting them to new function, at least to try to see how can we, could we conceive these habitats in an amuse, amusing way, in, a, uh, in the sense of a, a resort. So this is a project that I've done a few years ago, uh, a project proposal uh, where I studied how to fit inside the Transat, which was at that time um, a possible way to configure an hotel, distributing new function and uh, um, leaving more space to the creativity uh, in the use of uh, compatible materials but uh, with different colors, different textures and uh, so here we have an idea about these interiors and also uh, as we see the ceiling and the floors are not anymore recognizable because they are use usable and uh, rich of function spread around. So in the hotel we have to provide private rooms which could be different one from each other uh, and uh, used in a different way. We have to provide bathroom, uh, luckily if we can, if we have space, one bathroom for each uh, room or maybe one bathroom for a group of similar rooms. Then we have to provide one or two restaurants and uh, for sure uh, a good idea would be the gym where to uh, experiment uh, in a different way, uh, gymnastic and mobility of uh, our body and uh, absolutely a health care room where to monitor our physical condition. And uh, why not uh, absolutely a fun room or something uh, completely different from what we know on the earth. And uh, also the safe events, uh, which are basically uh, those uh, safe areas, safe rooms or compartments where to go in the case of danger, particular um, danger or particular conditions, which can be organized like common rooms where to relax, uh, watch TV, movies or read. Here instead uh, is the last uh, um, uh, big, uh, sequence of pictures that I will show you. Is uh, a, a project proposal that uh, I've done last year, uh, where um, there was the idea to uh, adapt the Svezda service module uh, to the new function of a space hotel, and where, um, due to the diversity of uh, the, the function of uh, the module itself, it was possible uh, to cut a little bit of weight uh, because, uh, like the small, small like block here, is not uh, more uh, 
or any more necessary, or some of, of the equipment for the missions, for the experiments, and to readapt it, cutting basically uh, this module in two, uh, from one part, uh, from one side, uh, to, um, we would have uh, uh, the control station and the service area, let's say, with the bathroom uh, and the healthcare um, area. And from the other side, uh, we would have a, a large, quite large uh, room where to fit new functions, uh, a multifunctional room, obviously. And here in the middle, uh, three cabins, because this would, was an effort um, done in order to host three people, one astronaut or cosmonaut, to uh, keep control of the station and uh, to guest. And uh, here uh, we have another view where we see from one side here on the left the, the, the table which doesn't need the support because we are in microgravity so we have cables where we can flow around. And here the three private cabins which are a little bit small but in any case uh, offer, are able to offer private time and privacy in general. And here we have a, a view of uh, the interior <coughs> and the cabin and here a view of, uh, uh, from the other side uh, of the room with a table. So this is uh, all and uh, if you have questions, you can... Thank you very much, Paula. Why does everybody give another round of applause for all the speakers? They did a really good job. <laughs> now, I know it's uh, 12 noon, and some of you may be going to the uh, sessions in the other room, so if you need to go, you can do that now. Or if you want to stick around, uh, Q&A. Um, we'll, we'll do maybe about 10, 15 minutes maximum for Q&A. Does so everybody have any questions? Just raise their hands. Yes, sir. What was the cost of the zero G ride? The cost of the zero G ride? Uh, we haven't uh, we haven't published a price yet, but it'll probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, uh, four thousand uh, dollars. Right now, it's about fifty five hundred dollars to do it in Russia, but it's also traveling to Russia and spending four or five days of your time. So and and half the program. Yes? During the preparation of training, does the zero G passenger have to come here? Nothing in advance of getting there. You just show up, you will have to have uh, signed a liability waiver, uh, you will have to have signed a medical release form, uh, and in certain circumstances, if you have any pre existing conditions, have to get released from your medical. But in most cases, not. And then uh, your training takes place that day, and your flight takes place that day. Uh, physical requirements are um, uh, uh, right now basically if you can ride a roller coaster ride, you can ride on this. Say it roughly. Anyone else? How long is the flight? The flight for the public will be about an hour and a half. I'm sorry, didn't hear that question. When is the start or is it going now? Uh, we haven't initiated. We hope to begin operations this summer. Uh, and we'll make announcements there. We, we ba basically have been keeping things low key until everything is fun finalized and real. Um, <coughs> so I'm, I'm hoping we'll begin, we'll, we'll get our, our final our FAA training flights done this summer and we'll begin operations this summer. So uh, if you go to zero G Corp com, C R O G C O R P dot com, you can you know plug your name in there and, and uh, you'll be kept informed. But again, we are not going to be selling individual seats. Companies like Space Adventures uh, will be doing that. We're going to be uh, wholesaling the airplane to corporations or resellers or uh, researchers and such. A couple of questions: one for the panel and, and one for the audience. First one for the audience: How many people have the Express credit card? Yep. And, and for the rest of you, why do you not? Interest rates. 
portion of, of your financing for X Prize is coming from the credit card? Uh, the credit card company funded half the person. Okay. I would point out to people that this is a zero cost to you way to, to fly your flag and support the most brilliant thing that has ever been done in the, in the history of the space active movement. And, Visa -based. and, and uh, can, it, it's, it's a Visa card through, well, it used to be your first USA. Yeah, it's it's bank one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, question to the panel as a whole, though, is do you find the regulatory environment that are the problem with it being this confusing or that it's too steep and multiplied or both? I would say. Right now, it's uh, is, is the main problem the, the rigorousness of the law or the, the you situation? think it's they're treating uh, manned reusable wash vehicles as unmanned expendable wash vehicles, and so there has to be uh, there has to be some changes. It's really it's not that the regulations are, are overly stringent; it's just that they're not. But I'll also add that uh, the most basic measures we're not waiting for the U.S. government.